Um, we're going to change scales now. We're going from Mark's discussion of sort of atmospheric top-down approaches to how do microbes influence the production and consumption of greenhouse gases within agricultural soils. Um, this work is being led actually by my colleague, Dr. Chung-Chun Lee, at the University of New Hampshire. He is a modeler, a biogeochemical modeler, and Jia Tang, a postdoc that's been working with us on, on this effort. So, excuse me, I'll take an initial overview of what we know about California agriculture and N2O emissions from an inventory perspective, and I'll give a fairly detailed discussion of how we try to model N2O emissions, because it's really a tough nut to crack. Um, the microbial processes are highly dynamic, both spatially and temporally. And so how can we build a modeling infrastructure that can help us at the field level, but also potentially for bottom-up estimates to reconcile with the top-down estimates that Mark has got at the, at the state level scale. Um, I'll talk a little bit about field measurements and issues of field measurements for calibrating and validating these models. Um, and then how do we assess how well is the model working? How well is it working at the field scale? How well is it working at the farm scale? How well is it working at the state scale? And then um, with a summary discussion of the results of the validation that we've done and how it could potentially be used, or the modeling system could be used to support the inventory. So as we've heard already, that agriculture represents about 8% of the state inventory looking at the 2013 ARB inventory. So we're going to focus on nitrous oxide. So how is nitrous oxide produced in an agroecosystem? So it's really it's a byproduct of microbial processes. There's um, denitrification, which is the reduction of nitrate to various gas forms, and to what produced as a byproduct of that process. There's nitrification, which is the oxidation of ammonia, again, another microbial process. And it's clear that for California, given its Mediterranean climate and field research done by our colleagues at UC Davis, that nitrification pathway seems to be a very important source of n production in agroecosystems here. So what controls the production and emissions of N2O in agricultural soils? Highly complex. You need to understand various forms of nitrogen, nitrate, nitrite, ammonium, um, dynamics and salt, organic carbon, how microbial populations respond to soil environment. A big trigger is what we call soil redux potential. In essence, what this is, is think of it as part of the availability of oxygen or how anaerobic the soils become. And we typically use soil moisture as a surrogate for that, but also understanding substrate dynamics helps us to model that at the field scale. And I, I will emphasize several times in this presentation how episodic N2O emissions are. And it comes to do with how we do the measurements as well as how we develop the modeling infrastructure to do that. So if we look at the ARB inventory, fertilizer use represents about 45% of the total N2O emissions for California agriculture, direct emissions from the soil. Newer use, another 45%. Crop residues, the last 10% of, of the inventory. Um, so it's clear that soil N2O is an important component of the total emission inventory, representing about 20% of the statewide 8% emissions from agriculture. I want to emphasize that these initial estimates from the ARB use an emission factor approach, and I'll, and I'll circle back to that in a moment. So what do we know about emissions of N2O? Highly variable, spatially and temporally. This figure shows some measurement data and some modeling done from a vineyard in Oakville, California, in Napa Valley. And you can see that most of the time, N2O emissions from this field are essentially zero. Very little emissions. And then you have these episodes or periods where you have the high emissions that represent the majority of the seasonal or annual emissions. So we clearly need to have a measurement system that captures those peaks and build a modeling system that can simulate the drivers that cause those peaks of emissions and reductions over time. The um, DNDC model, which is the tool that we're using for this analysis, was developed by Chung Shin Lee. It's focusing on really on understanding decomposition and denitrification as the two main sources of losses of carbon and nitrogen from agroecosystems. It's been in development for about a little over 25 years. It was developed specifically to look at N2O from agroecosystems. 
But if, to do that properly, you have to look at decomposition or net CO2 changes, methane production, crop growth and yield, ammonia volatilization, and nitrate movement through the soil. And it's a mechanistic model. So by that, I mean it tries to model the processes or mechanisms like denitrification and nitrification that control the emissions and productions of emission driven by microbial dynamics. So the scientific cases. Uh, on the left, you have a list of oxidants, starting from oxygen. And in the center column, you have the redox potential. So again, the biogeochemical reactions or processes are shown on the right depend on the soil redox dynamics in terms of what microbes can be active during that soil environment. And you'll see for N2O, the fairly broad production range, ranging from 500 to 200 millivolts of redox conditions, where you have nitrification occurring in the more aerobic soils and denitrification in the less aerobic soils. Now, as anybody who's worked with soils, I know that soils are heterogeneous. You have some areas of pockets of of wetter soils, drier soils, we have to try to model that whole spatial dynamic um, in a biogeochemical model like the NDC. And then eventually when the systems become highly anaerobic, we have production of methane in uh, um, flooded soils like rice production. So this is how the model basically works. It models which microbes are going to be active based on simulating the redox dynamics that's so determined by the EEH driven uh, drivers, so decomposers. Uh, decomposition of organic material, nitrifiers, denitrifiers, and methanogens. That will tell us which microbial community is active. How active they'll be, though, is driven by how much energy is available. We need to be able to simulate dissolved organic carbon. That's an energy source that the microbes use to survive. In addition, the microbes have to give off energy to survive, and they need what we call electron acceptors. And these are substrates that the microbes use to pass electrons on and actually result in the production of greenhouse you know, gas emissions. And so if it's, if it's aerobic, highly aerobic, oxygen is the available substrate of the microbes, CO2 is produced. As you get more anaerobic, denitrification, you know, nitrates the substrate, you produce N2O. If you get highly anaerobic, so there's no oxygen, no nitrate available, you now use organic carbon as the substrate, and hence you produce methane. So that's a sort of modeling construct of the DNC model. Farming practices. The model is developed to understand how management of agroecosystems influence the production and consumption of these gases. So one can imagine that fertilization or irrigation is going to change conditions, change the amount of organic carbon available, change the level of oxygen or redox in the soils, change the availability of electron acceptors for the production and consumption of greenhouse gas emissions. I won't go into detail, but this is the wiring diagram of the model. But the, the, the premise is we can use ecological drivers, so weather patterns, soil conditions, cropping conditions, and human activity and management to simulate soil environmental factors that drive the production of yeah. This wiring diagram just goes to the model that the model uses for simulating the carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus cycle. So we have this modeling infrastructure. How well does it work? Well, first, we need to calibrate it with local data. I actually had the pleasure of working very closely with several UC Davis researchers. They're doing field studies on, on you know, gas emissions. We need to validate it. The model will give you an answer. The validation must rely on data that we got independent of the calibration data. One of the issues is, is these process models are data hungry. There's a lot of information on daily dynamics. Many field studies don't have the resources to collect those data. So there may be some very good field data that have been published for understanding a, a particular emission profile. They don't have the answer data that the process model is needed for independent validation. That said, we need to be validated intensively worldwide and well over 300 different papers um, for ongoing additional work in California to do new management systems and seeing how well the model how do we then take measurements and evaluate it against the model? So we're using the model to estimate seasonal emissions or annual emissions, and you have a set of measurement points. This is an example of a tomato system in California, the red dots of the measurement. How do you extrapolate, interpolate the measurement data to seasonal or annual emissions to compare to the model? 
two different approaches. One uses the linear interpolation, shown um, by the dashed line. The blue line is an exponential uh, decay function to do the interpolation. For this particular study, you see you get vastly different results if you use different interpolation techniques, linear versus exponential. Much higher emissions if you use linear. Clearly, the measurements caught some of the peak. You don't know what happened before or after that. So it's hard to use those infrequent measurements to extrapolate the seasonal emissions from all comparisons. So here's some data collected by a colleague at with AARS with the um, sub daily over a season. And you'll see a typical dynamic of these emission peaks followed by a decrease in emissions over time. So un to understand how best to interpolate, we analyze this is with our done uh, with a colleague at, at ARS at Beltsville. Cavagelli, that looked at each of those peaks and subsequent emission drops, how best to characterize it. We had to interpolate measurements where we don't have this frequent sub-daily measurement. And if you look at it, you can actually break this information into a series of exponential decays for each of those different peaks. So in this case, we looked at 15 different peaks. Eleven of those peaks were characterized much better using an exponential decay function as opposed to a linear function. Through that, we now have access to the field data that we've collected from our colleagues. The four panels shows, um, I guess some of the figures not quite showing, but we have winter wheat on the upper left, we have almonds in the upper right, we have tomatoes in the lower left, and alfalfa fields. In general, the model, which is the line figures, is capturing the peaks fairly well. We see some cases where we miss the peaks, but in general, the model is performing pretty well. Here, here are the 40 data sets that we analyzed in aggregate. Again, look at the models. You see basically there seems to be a pretty good correlation between model estimates and measurements using uh, the exponential decay function for extrapolating uh, field measurements in time to a season or a year. There are a couple cases, or one case in particular, where the model significantly um, underestimate or overestimated emissions as measured. That was in the alpha field. We're working with the field scientists to understand why um, the model does not seem to be capturing that particular scenario. So if we begin to look at emission inventories, emission factors are typically used. So we took the same data sets and compared DNC model estimates with the IPCC emission factor. And you can see from this that the IPCC emission factor appears to be overestimating N2O emissions. So there's been a lot of research at ARB and UC Davis to try to collect more appropriate California emission factors. So it's clear that the IPCC emission factors which were developed globally are not applicable here as well for the Mediterranean climate and cropping systems that we find in California. Um, if you want to do additional greenhouse gas sources with process modeling, we'll do a quick run through of these other studies that we're working on with DNDC to look at N2O for manure management, land application phase, by methane, methane from manure storage, enteric emissions, and indirect emissions of quantifying of ammonia. This is ongoing work. Um, Will Horwath and his group did some field studies looking at manure applications, and you'll see that his results indicate emissions from 5 to 16 plus kilograms of NN2O from the land application of manure for corn systems, much higher than the other systems that we saw previously. So we're working with them to calibrate and validate the models here. These two panels show the corn production system in Santa Claus and Sacramento County. Again, the model seems to be capturing some of the peaks. Predict some peaks where they didn't pick up measurements, and there's some measurements of peaks that we did not capture. So this research is ongoing. We've done extensive rice methane validation for California, as well as for other growing, rice growing regions in the U.S. Again, the model here is actually performing quite well for rice methane. We're in the process now of validating a manure DNC model, which is, looks at the whole farm, so it, it applies the DNC biochemistry to the feedlot, to the housing manure in that fresh excreta all the way through the storage and treatment facilities to the land application phase. And we're trying to improve the mechanistic nature of the enteric submodel. As we heard, enteric methane is an important source from agricultural methane production in California. So we want to get to a mechanistic understanding. So we're working with Ernest Cabrera at UC Davis to incorporate that into the manure DADC framework. In general, we seem to be capturing the dynamics of uh, methane emissions from uh, liquid storage of manure. In addition, if we're looking at N2O, ammonia is a source for indirect N2O emissions and a precursor for PM. 
So we're validating the model across a fleet of dairy and swine production systems in the U.S. Again, the model seems to be performing quite well for ammonia emissions at that scale. So it seems like these modeling states to be a useful tool to help support the California inventory. Um, the model at this point seems to be fairly well calibrated for N2O and methane. Um, we're working on the fresh manure as well as other um, sources of agricultural emissions to support the, the inventory. Basically, what we do is we take spatial data on soils, weather drivers, agricultural management, and drive the, mo the model at that scale. So it depends on the scale of the input uh, input data, come up with a national or uh, statewide inventory, and then we have an uncertainty tracking system. If we know there's uncertainties in our inputs as well as model structural validation. Lastly, we're moving this from a research tool to a tool that's broadly available. So we're in the process of creating an open source project so that the code will be available to all communities. And as one can imagine, this model has been developed for 20 plus years by Chung Shin Lee, who's a researcher. He's not a software engineer. It's spaghetti code. It's difficult for other people to handle it. So we're in the process of actually rewriting the code so that it's fairly transparent readily available to the broader range of stakeholders ranging from uh, researchers to those developing decision support tools to help support uh, climate smart agriculture. And this project will be supported by the Global Research Alliance modeling platform. So in summary, through our collaboration with UC Davis, we've been able to do extensive validation of the model. It seems to be performing pretty well for N2O, but some cases where it doesn't perform so well, that's just the nature of N2O emissions. Um, we can link it with spatial data to help support the inventory. Um, we're ongoing work with, with, with ARB support looking at manure applications, and we have this open source project to distribute the science and the tools to the broader range of stakeholders as we need to deal with climate smart agriculture in the future. Thank you for your time.